Welcome to episode 110 of the Saints FC podcast. With me this evening, I have the illustrious Mr. Tom Parker. Tom, how, how are you? That's very kind, I'm good. Everything's better after a win, isn't it? Everything is better after a win. I was just thinking, I was just listening to that Shane Long commentary, thinking, God, we're going into a semi final again. Yeah. Hopefully, this one's going to be better than the Chelsea semi final. I don't a few even years ago, fine. I know it was two 0 It's kind of. I don't know what why I don't remember it or anything. What was... I I remember it. I I actually managed to wangle some corporate tickets for this one. So I had my two normal tickets, which I think me and my brother managed to get through our our Saints membership, and then I also managed to get two corporate tickets, which meant um, I could take my dad, despite the fact he lived in Portugal and never went to a Saints game that season this first one was the was the uh, was the FA Cup semi-final courtesy of a uh, energy provider that used to supply my old workplace with energy hey you know I you know I, I paid I think 500 odd quid for two club Wembley tickets uh, to watch us loot cheated against Man United John so if you can get the tickets for free yeah take- I had to sign a form because like if, if we if we took a like a, a donation or a gift from a potential, even if it's an existing company, so not someone that's actually bidding for anything, we had, had to declare it and state what the value was and, and all of this stuff. But yeah, anyway. Pretty, pretty par, I'm afraid. Pretty powerful, for the course. But yeah, yeah. yeah, I just don't remember that game. I don't know why. It was a Giroud sort of... Um, oh, did he just do yeah. it? Yeah. So- Let's focus back on the Shane Long semi final. But you know, maybe that's one of the problems, yeah. So they do the semi finals in Wembley and it's sort of it's not as magical as going to Anfield and um Yeah, yeah. nicking it in front of the Liverpudlians there. Shane well, Long yeah. collapsing in front of the away end. Because in, in old money, this semi final would have been played on a neutral ground, wouldn't it? So that's unless probably that's Villa Park, big, let's face Villa it. Park, I was gonna say, yeah. What is it? Saints Leicester. So that might have been too Midlandsy. Yeah, but this all, is there anywhere in the in the middle of the Midlands? They might, they, would they have given us a London ground for between Saints and Leicester? Maybe. Yeah, it could have been um, like Highbury, the old Highbury. Did or, they ever do an or, FA Cup semi final there? Yeah, probably. Or White Hart Lane. Yeah. Or the in New Money, whatever the new White Hart Lane is. I, I think we're, to, we're talking about old money here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah it would, I guess it would have been like... Well, Hillsborough a, would have been a good one. Have you ever been to Hillsborough, Tom? I've never actually been uh, in Hillsborough. I like Hillsborough. It's meant to be a great ground. Yeah, proper yeah. old-fashioned stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, that. but now obviously everything has to be at Wembley, diminishing it. Um, in it's all, yeah. You want to be halfway through the semi-final leading and thinking, oh my God, we're going to Wembley. We're going to that terrible pub. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible pub, great <laughs> memories. Yes. Lots of stickers of Francis Bernali. Everywhere. Like in Milan there was. He's Everywhere. here, he's there. Um, so I mean if we're gonna talk about we will get on to the course final because we've got some we've got some other business to get through, but just think about this. Was Red this is something for you to ponder before we get to the Saints Bournemouth game. Was that Redmond's best game since the first leg of that semi final against Liverpool? Was it even better? It's well worth pondering. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Right. So we've got two Premier League games that we have to kind of get through. We're obliged to. Otherwise, we can't get through the season. So we covered every Saints game in the season. So we're obliged to go through these. Um, The Man City Saints game was on at 6 p.m., which is a time that I am not able to watch football, really. So. 
dad myself. It's not a time for football. No, it's just not. no, it just doesn't work. No, it doesn't work with young kids. See also 12 o'clock kickoffs on Mother's Day. No, not. <laughs> As you described it, suboptimal. Suboptimal scheduling, please. Yeah. Um, so how, how did you wangle that one? I, I made it so that I was cooking a roast that would be delivered uh, at 2 p.m. To the, to the dining table. So I thought, you know, I have two hours focused on cooking. So I, I wangled it by over-indexing. So mm. I started with uh, box fizz and uh, ham and cheese croissants oh. in the mornings. Basically, I went big early. Mm. Um, flowers from our Tom, little girl. I'm thinking I want to mother your child now. This is... Uh... And, um, uh, you know, I went big. Thinking, obviously, my wife deserves it because she's yeah. an amazing mother. Also, <laughs> Nothing you know, to do with the fact that there's a Saints game later on. If I invest big early on, I can get Saints. <laughs> little did I know that I would have uh, rather have, like, smashed my head through the oven. Yeah. Uh, you Saints. could have just got a Marmite taste and a coffee, mate, and done without the Saints game. I would have happily, in, in, if I'd have known, if I'd have known now, I knew then I would have happily <laughs> bypassed that that game. I but. wonder how many um, mothers of Saints fans, or you know, wives of Saints fans who, who are the mother of their children, got an exceptionally good Mother's Day breakfast <laughs> or dinner to accommodate that game. And then you, a, a grumpy, there, there are no winners here, apart from Brighton and mothers loosely associated with Southampton Football Club. Well, even then, you know, as my wife might put it, you know, watching football on Mother's Day is not a thing <laughs> really allowed. So there's feedback there, and, you know, a wiser man than me once said all feedback is a gift. So um, I'll take that on board for next year. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll get to the other awful kickoff. Man City 5, Saints 2. Um, I've just watched the highlights of this, Tom. And uh, I didn't watch the game. I didn't go back and watch the full 90 minutes. Don't really enjoy watching Saints concede five goals that that frequently. Um, But I did read a couple of the articles about the game. And it was maybe more than meets the eye in terms of the the scoreline. But um, what I did read is that the defending was absolutely shambolic. So sort of Saints played well, apart from where Man City got near to their box and then all bets were off. Is that a fair I, assessment? Or? I think that's a little bit harsh. So Saints, I mean, Pep Guardiola said that Saints were the best team to come. Did he say it was something along these lines? One of the, the best teams to come to the Etihad or played for the first 20 minutes? Played. Yeah, but, you know, he says that about teams that they beat. It doesn't say about teams that beat them. He says that about, like, you know, like he's like pulling the legs off a spider. Um, yeah. You're the best, you're the most fearsome creature yeah. I've ever come across. <laughs> The spider, as I put my my magnifying glass over you and burn you to a crisp. Um, yeah, well, look, a game of football is obviously ninety minutes long. If it had been twenty minutes long, um, it would have been probably one of Saints' best performances. I mean, like, let's not forget, you know, ravaged by injuries. Um, well, I'm resting a lot of rotating, resting, resting the players who might even come in with no right back. Um, Man City are just animals as well. Like, so, so who actually played right back in this game then, Tom? Uh, it was Benarek, I think, wasn't it? Benarek and Salisu oh. and Vestergaard in the middle. Yeah, I think so. Okay. From, yeah, kind of, it seems a long go. Look, I mean, we lost 5-2 and that's what the history books will look at. And when, yeah, when people look at the scores of this another unbelievable, ridiculous season from... Manchester City will just say 5-2 and everyone will go, well, of course, that's what Man City do. But first 20 minutes, Saints were bloody brilliant. They matched Man City man for man. They took the game to them. Um, they had a plan. You know, we had square pegs in round holes. We were unlucky. Um, we, had a fair, we had a fair penalty given, which obviously JWP scored. And look... You know, we kind of imploded because of self-inflicted mistakes. Um, and whilst, of course, that is still not good, you know, I the game would have been different had it gone in one all. Yeah, half time. Like we might, we probably still would have lost. Would we have conceded five? I don't think so. But. Remind me of the score. Was it 2-1 or 3-1 at half time? I think it was 3-1. So it's 
when Man City 1-0, then 1-1 with a James Will Prowse penalty. Then McCarthy gave away a penalty which wasn't a penalty, which I saw the replay and I don't understand how that wasn't a penalty. Uh, um, then you had James Will Prowse nearly lobbing Ed- Edison. Yeah. That was quite good. That would have put Saints 2-1 up. Um, but then Mares scored. Yeah. Well, this is from Shea Adams makes a mistake. Yeah. And, and then, it, is, then it was 3-1 from a Gundogan rebound off a Mares shot. So it's 3-1 at halftime. Yeah. Your question. And the Saints kind of fell apart. Mm. Um, in Man City, make it easy for you to fall apart because of the pressure they put you on and the fact they just don't ever stop. Um, but look, I think, you know, 5-2, it probably didn't flatter Man City, um, but it also wasn't, I don't think it was a terrible night for Saints either. I think, you know, we learned that despite what we think, Jack Stevens is probably certainly not cut out to play centre midfield against that team. Um, it was interesting that McCarthy was brought in as almost like a sacrificial lamb. Mm. Um, don't damage Fraser's confidence don't damage Fraser's confidence keep Fraser's stats good on championship manager and uh, don't um, yeah don't make him concede a slew of goals and only three teams have scored twice at the Etihad this season in the certainly in the league Leicester's one of them Man United are another one and Saints are another one did either Leicester or Man United concede five whilst they went and got their two no they conceded zero I think in yeah. their performances but let's focus on the positives I and mean, like, you know, I, I don't think it was that bad a performance i really don't i think saints were saints were punished but that's what man city do mm. um you know for all saints trouble if, if saints end up in really big trouble this this year it's not going to be that game that hurts them no and it, I, one of the things which i i took from this game which i, I thought was quite coincidental is that James Will Prowse and Adams who are the two scorers from the game against Sheffield United both got goals again so it's good to see them both scoring um, certainly our two most prolific players in the side at the moment whilst Ings is out and Ings is probably nearly back now isn't he well that's it now I think um, you know all being equal with everything we know um, Ings should be if not you know if not uh, starting Against Burnley, well, he probably good. won't, will he? Based on form, um, well, I think that second striker spot's still available, isn't it? I think it's probably safe to stay, uh, safe to stay alongside Shea Adams, Shea McAdams. Um, but yeah, uh, well, look, like, the Man City game was, was, um, you know, it happened, yeah. It, I mean, it, put it this way, could have been a lot worse because in the second half, when they started. Just it looked like there was a bit where we looked like a bit like Man United, where we looked like that we would just concede every time they went into our half. Okay, well that that didn't happen, so that's a relief. Yeah. But I mean, we've now got—is it the worst defense, second to worst defense in the Premier League this season? Mm. After West Brom. I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. We've conceded five twice and nine once. That's not great. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the equivalent of point five goals a game for the entire season, just in three games. <laughs> Um, yeah, so could have been worse. Um, <laughs> having match report. Well, I, what I think was quite interesting about this game is like we obviously rotated, we rested players, and this was all with the fact that we were sort of throwing this game. We knew we weren't going to win it. Let's go rest these players and make sure we absolutely batter Brighton, get the three points, keep Ooh. them at a good length. Um, and, you know, th- then we can forget about relegation or, or worrying about having to look over our shoulders and, and press on and just concentrate on the FA Cup. So that didn't go well, did it? Yeah. I mean, I, I would put, you know, went into the Brighton game with quite a lot of confidence. You know, I think you've got a good record against yeah. Brighton. Um, you know, they're without Lamptey, who's arguably their best player. Um, they don't really have a, a sort of, deadly forward, a big, horrible, strong forward, the type that we normally struggle against. And, you know, they're below us in the league and, you know, we did a number of them at their place. I thought this was kind of nailed on for Saints. Um, we also had a relatively strong team out there. Mm. Um, probably our first choice team, apart from maybe Romeo and Ings. Um, and we started really badly. You know, I think, like, I don't know why. Um, 
but we just didn't look like we were there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't have Saints down as starting really badly. I had Brighton start well as my my first line, which I I think they did. And, you know, it's one of those things where lots of people have been saying that Brighton are a good side, they're underperforming their XG. They're a better side than their position is in the league. Yeah, So, so we've heard all of that and we knew all of that. But I still think, you know, pound for pound, player for player, Saints so, should be beating Brighton. And actually, yeah. when, when Saints click, we're still better than Brighton when they're clicking. But we definitely didn't click in, in this game at all. I just thought we were really, really bad. The first half was... The first 20 minutes, I think, were awful. Then things got better. Yeah. Um, I think sort of after Brighton scored, we looked a little bit more at it. Yeah. And um, did Adams get his goal in the first half or the second half? Yeah, it was first no, half, so, wasn't it? So, you know, we started. I mean, you can say Brighton started well. I would argue we started really poorly. They they pressed us really aggressively. They were in our face. Um, they're physically very strong. They played with kind of three centre backs when we attacked, pushing into like a 4-4-2 four, four, with the, one of the centre-backs pushing into the left-back, um, you know, which we kind of struggled to get a grip on. Um, and Saints just looked all a bit flummoxed. And then, you know, Brighton scored a goal, which wasn't undeserved. Um, and it was a stupid goal. Like, I, I, it's a really good header, but players shouldn't be scoring headers from the penalty area, from, from the penalty box, from the, from, sorry, from the penalty spot. You know, um, you know, they just physically shouldn't be scoring a header from there. It, and whilst it was a good header, it was low. Um, I, again, I'd have thought Fraser Forster should have got a hold of it. For me, it it, it looked like it was savable. And Fraser doesn't dive. And I... We said this a lot about Fraser Force. He struggles with shots low down mm. because of I mean, his size and you know width and everything about him. He's not nimble, and it, it struck me as the sort of thing that McCarthy probably would have saved. Do you think? But, yeah, but also like, why have we got no one on the posts? Well, it wasn't from a corner, though, was it? Yeah, I thought it was from a just a cloth across an open play. Yeah. It was a it was a corner, you know. Dunk is their big man. He did it against Saints yeah. uh, last year, and I think we got away with it because of Bar. Yeah, he's who they aim for at corners every single time. Him and Ben White. So there's two players. We've got. He's running in from the edge of the box. Like, why is Ryan Bertrand on him for a start? Like, why is it not Vestergaard or Ben? Not Vestergaard or Beck. You know, why is it Ryan Bertrand? Yeah, or even like it should be like Shea Adams, someone's bigger and stronger and more aggressive. Um, it's a it's a good header. Yeah, it's a really good header. But like I don't know, Forster to me to reacts too slowly. And then, I mean, that, if, if Fraser Forster could get used to coming for crosses, imagine that. But he's never. Been, this, but this is too. I mean, this six, is too six far seven out. Seven coming out. Do you think? Yeah, but it's too far out. That's why. You, you've got to think, like, either it's too far out for the goalkeeper to come, and if it's too far out for the goalkeeper to come, it's probably too far out for someone to score a header. And I I, don't, I just don't get it. Like, it was really bad management from Saints. Like, they're big centre-back, up against Ryan Bertrand. Uh, you know, no one on the posts. Um, they've got good ball players. You know, Trossard and, and Lallana, they've got good footballers who can put the ball anywhere they want it. and But, you know, the, the only good thing about that goal was it woke Saints into action because we were not really there before. And then with, for 20 minutes, we battered them. Yeah. And I think when Adams got his goal, it really felt like it was coming as well, didn't it? Yeah. And it, and it felt like it felt deserved and it felt that Saints had changed, the, not changed, but they'd sort of stepped up again. Minamino looked really good. Like Minamino looked for kind of, unplayable and yeah you know we looked so much better Adams looks threatening Will Prowse is playing well and it was a it was a good goal uh it was a really good finish and you kind of got the feeling that Saints were just going to go on and win it 
And, you know, if they weren't 2 1 up at half time, they'd be 2 1 up shortly after half time mm. and then go on to win it. And we'd knock, this, knock the wind out of Brighton and, you know, they'd try and attack and we'd hit them on the counter and that would be that. And it wasn't thus. And, 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 and do we say, you know, obvious examples, let's put those aside. But in a game which actually mattered against an opponent that we should be beating, was this the worst half of football for Saints? So, so we'll, we'll exclude a couple of obvious examples, maybe the three games we mentioned before, but yeah. This was our Everton from last season. In terms of, I, it was so bad. It, I, it was the first time I've questioned Ralph, to be honest, like, and that makes me sound like a cult person, but... <laughs> My concern, and what made me do, what made me think about it, is like if he's if he's taken this group of players as far as he can take them, and I, it was this isn't an original thought. I think I someone tweeted this, and I I agree with it. Saints, Saints, you know, one of the things you'll hear two things when you listen to a commentator talk about Southampton game. You'll hear them talk about nine nils, mm-hmm. and if Southampton go in front, you will then hear Southampton lose lots of points from winning positions and I'd, I'd never thought about why before I just thought it's something that happens you know maybe it's because we press so much we get tired but the Brighton game was the perfect example and again like I can't remember who it was but they pointed out it's like other managers change their tactics mm. so Graham Potter sees that what he's doing before is not going to work like it's just not going to work and if it carries on like that, his team are going to lose. Graham Potter changes it in the second half. He just pushes players further forwards and pushes them to press Saints more aggressively. Saints play the same game of football they're playing in the first half. So they're playing. Saints are playing a different team. Yeah. You know, they're not playing the same Brighton that was working for them in the first half. They're playing a different Brighton. But Brighton have changed things. And for me, it was kind of the first time I thought, like, maybe about... You know, with Ralph, if if you know he has one way of doing it, which when it works is brilliant, but if it doesn't, then you know you got to think about when Ralph's assistant is it Danny? Can't remember it's Klitzenberg, Danny whatever. Ralph, uh, a, ki- a kitchen kitchen blitzer, kitchen blitzer. <laughs> uh, you know, left to to join. Was it Bayern he joined? And yeah. You wonder if now I imagine Ralph's a pretty dominant, forceful personality. And does he have anyone on that bench sat next to him that can turn to him and say, you need to change it? You know, that's what good leadership is about, is surrounding yourself with great people that give you difficult words of advice and prompt you to change direction if things aren't going your way. Yeah. And saints don't do that. So saints will consistently do the same thing and consistently get hurt. And the Brighton second half was... The worst second half, worst half of football from Saints this season. Players, even senior players like Armstrong, just look lost. Um, you know, you could see the frustration amongst the players. You know, you, there, there was a moment when Bestergaard sort of runs forward, brings the ball out of defence. You know, this is probably about like 60, 70 minutes into the game. We're chasing a game, horribly chasing a game. And, you know, there's no movement for it. He sort of, you know, or, or Benrick, I can't remember which one, he throws his hands in the air in frustration. Yeah. And nothing's happening. And, and the worst thing about it, you know, was that Brighton actually had a pretty comfortable second half. We didn't even, we didn't put them on the rack. It wasn't like we tried everything and it just didn't go in. Like you could argue against Newcastle, terrible first half, but in the second half we were just really unlucky. The ball just wouldn't go over the line. This was just something else. This was This was the worst most disjointed, most dispassionate, dissatisfactory, unprofessional performance you've seen it it's for saying since Everton last year at home. Yeah. And I know you know, and we've seen some great football in that time. And we've seen some really bad football in that time, but this was worse. Because you you'll take a lot, you know, they get hammered, it's gonna happen. All right, getting hammered nine 0 was unfortunate. Having it twice is very unfortunate. But the only thing that they can all do is they can at least seem to try. Yeah. And if they give up trying, then that, well, then you know, what does that tell you? I don't know. But there, there was just like there were 
absolutely no positives to take no. from the second no. half. The, the, the closest we got to anything was like Carl Walker Peter sort of stumbling in the penalty area and a half ass yeah. penalty shout. It was never a penalty. I mean, like, Brighton aren't that good. Yeah, Brighton aren't actually that good at all. We made them look very good. And they were more aggressive than us. Mm. And that's not something you think you would have said about. You know, we were we were being out for by Lalana. Um, was physically, you know, he wanted it more than the Saints players. They wanted it more. And we were getting bossed, you know, all over the pitch. I mean, this is a... It's, it's a problem that I think we've talked about. I mean, how long have we been doing this podcast now for, Tom? It was probably since... Yeah, four years now. It's, I think it's longer than that. We were certainly during Claude Puel era, weren't we? Yeah. yeah. Um, but the amount of times I feel that we've talked about Saints in this sort of situation where they don't seem to understand the urgency of the situation. And, and like... Yeah, I think under Pellegrino, under Hughes, the fans realised that we were in a battle and a fight long before it even occurred to the players. It's like they live in some sort of like dreamland bubble sometimes where they think, oh, everything's going to be fine. We're quite good. We're going to be fine. We don't even really have to try and it will work out okay. It's almost like banking on the future rather than actually just dealing, tackling with the issue there and then. Like, we need to beat teams that, like Brighton, regardless of whether we're a relegation-fighting team or whether we're a team that wants to get into Europe or whether we're a team that wants to get into the mid-table, that you have to beat Brighton at home. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, that's, and that is where, that's the manning thing, isn't it, about Saints? This is the totally mad thing. Is that, that was a pretty, that was a strong team we put out against yeah. Brighton. That's the first time in a while you could say, you know what, that's back to what resembles nearly a first team. Nine of the 11 probably starters are first team starters. And, and I think Diallo is not far off being a, you know, a challenging Romeo for his place. Because um, I still don't know if Walcott, you know, I think Minamino and Walcott are probably interchangeable right now. But what you worry about is the heads go down for Saints. And when they go down, they really plummet. And it's strange because, you know, I do think we've got some leaders on that pitch. I do think Bednarek is a leader. I do think Forster's probably a leader. Ward Prowse is 100% a leader. Um, they're, they're all a certain type of leader, though, aren't they? They're, there's no one on the pitch who is a leader in the same fold as, like, Jose Font or Virgil van Dijk was or, you know, let's go back, Franny Benali or... Do you, do you know? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, there's not any one player there who I think is going to rally the players when, yeah, when they need to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I think that's what we lost maybe with Hoiberg is we lost someone on the pitch who could get people going. But I mean, I reckon with Hoiberg was still pretty abysmal. Oh yeah, and we still have performances like this at home against Brighton with Hoiberg yeah. in the team. You know. So yeah, as we know. Um, you're exactly right. And Glenn Murray still did us every single time and went yeah. over with like, I don't know. I mean, it was for me, it was like I say, I've been a fervent, you know, pro Ralph and I still am. Um, but it was the first time I questioned it because it just, cause I can see that. Like, I didn't know anything about football. I knew nothing about football, you know, compared to what Ralph knows. You do have to sell yourself, though, Tom. I mean, you've got 30-odd years of studying it for a good couple of hours a week, at the very least. If what Ralph Ralph knows about football is a pint of water, I know the film on top of the pint of water. You know, he must know so much more. But why can they not see this game is, is going away? Like, Potter just changed his tactics. He didn't, like, do it massively. He didn't bring on three forwards, or he just literally plonked Basuma, Lalana. But, but and, um, wasn't one of the problems, though, that we did change our tactics in this game? In the way that we set up the side against Brighton? Yeah, but it, this, the way that we, we were playing well. Yeah. We lost the game initially. 
We got back on top. We scored a goal. Then Brighton changed. And we didn't change. And another thing with Ralph, and, you know, like, there are players, Saints have too many players that disappear when the going gets tough. And uh, they have real leaders that step up, like Armstrong and Will Prowse. Don't get me wrong. But there's too many players that disappear. And Ralph takes too long to make changes. And everyone laughs at, like, you know, like back in the day when Mourinho would take players off after the 30 minutes. But, like, at the end of the day, it sent a message, didn't it? And, you know, people laughed at uh, Tuchel for taking off Hudson Adoy against Saints. Mm. Saints it's cruel. Well, you know what? How many goals have Chelsea conceded? Are Saints probably the only team, I think, to score against the Tuchel team? They've just beat Atletico Madrid 2 0 in Madrid. I think, like, you know, it's ruthlessness. And with Saints against Brighton, Minamino, who was very effective in the first half, did nothing. Yeah. In the second half. But it takes him 25 minutes to get taken off. Yeah. Not influencing the game. If you, you know, like Bill Shankly said, if you're not in, like about offside, if you're not influencing the game, you shouldn't be playing. And Saints have too many players that disappear. And, you know, it, it was just very distressing to watch. Well, what? One of the um, things which I think is probably m- most interesting about this Brighton game is I don't think much was said after the Brighton game, but actually Ralph um, said something to Tom Leach in the Daily Echo after the Bournemouth game about the Brighton game, which I thought was, was quite interesting. Um, and he said to, he had you know very clear meetings this week just gone with the players about what went wrong at, at Brighton. And he said sort of like once the post-match dressing room shouting had called, so he's obviously gone in there and laid into them, um, he sat down with his players, talked through their plan, addressed their concerns and calmed them for the week ahead and then took them onto the field at Staplewood to work on what went wrong against Brighton and what they can do better against Bournemouth. Um and, it, you know, he said, like, I told them what I expect from them, from us, from the club over the weekend. It now looks that everybody was very clear as what as to what they had to do. I mean, obviously, he's saying that after a quite a convincing win. And he's, he also mentions, you know, we were quick, we were not turning back, and we were more in front. And so I think those are maybe the issues that he's noted that, that we had against Brighton. And it's an interesting point, you know, whether it should be the changing of the tactics mid-game or how do you motivate the players? If the players are not being motivated by a natural-born leader on the pitch who can sort of shake them out of their slumber and get them to really focus on, on the task at hand, then Ralph's got to do that from the sideline. And it's not as though they can't hear him. Yeah. You know, that something needs to change in that situation. And it, sometimes I watch Ralph, and I think uh, this was evident to me during the second half against Brighton, is that when the cameras cut to him on the side of the pitch, he looked quiet and devoid of ideas and shocked, and, you know, the colour draining from his face, rather than... Think of Ralph sort of post the first lockdown. He was playing every single pass, every tackle, every shot. He was, like, living it on the touchline, wasn't he? Yeah, and I, I do think maybe there's an element here of like, because Saints have been Saints have been such a yo-yo, haven't they? They've been mm. so times, and then so bad. And you wonder if like he doesn't quite like he always watches like a game against Brighton. He's like, hang on a minute, this is the, this is a this is the team I put out almost man for man who beat Liverpool when Liverpool were actually still pretty damn good and held on. Four two for now, for eighty six minutes against Liverpool. Yeah, why is this? You know, like almost like you know the problem they said about Hoddle when he was a manager, which is that he couldn't understand why players couldn't do what he what could he, do. And you know, you hear that a lot, don't you, about like really good players who go manage in lower leagues and they don't understand that the players can't do what they and all their teammates were able to do. And maybe he doesn't understand that the same players can do one thing. And then be so terrible. But, you know, ultimately he carries the can for it. I mm. think, um, the you know, the Brighton game has been a gone. Obviously now it's Burnley that matters. And I, I think 
Yeah, it, this is a weird time for football, isn't it? I mean, would Saints have played like that had they been at St Mary's and 30,000 Saints fans would have been pushing them on? Yes, probably would have done. <laughs> yes, we probably, probably would have, would have done. Fans would have been slagging them off. Um, <laughs> No, because um, if anyone is in Stop Mary's, passing the ball backwards. Don't go backwards. Shoot from 35 yards, even though the XG is going to be minus seven. <laughs> Why don't you just shoot? Like telling like, you know, Carl Walker Peters, who's never scored a professional goal in his career, to shoot from 35 yards from the from the corner flag uh, angle. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Look, I mean, it was a terrible game. Terrible, 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 terrible game. And I don't know what else you can say about it. Well, let's let's move on and uh, forget the Premier League for a few glorious moments, Tom, because... They were raised it anyway, John. Yeah. Saints were in the FA Cup quarterfinal at the weekend. Um, I did manage to watch this. Again, I was cooking cooking a, uh, a roast. A Saturday roast. How, how's that? Why are you doing a roast on Saturday, John? I quite like the well, tactic. It worked, really- worked well for being able to watch the Bryson game. I actually wanted to get some enjoyment out of this one. Yeah, and you can have a drink as well cooking a roast. That's the law. Definitely. You know, one glass of wine for the gravy, one for yourself. Exactly. So you, so you got to watch this one. Yeah. I, I, I've so, got to admit, Tom, I was a bit worried beforehand because this is sort of like classic FA Cup upset sort of territory with a Premier League team that's in dreadful form, doing really badly, comes up against a championship side who's in pretty good form chasing playoffs or promotion yeah, and that two clubs obviously as well yeah has spice yeah a little, little bit of spice after we sort of ended any chance of them staying up last season and and Bournemouth were giving it the big ones before before the game up. yeah so I was a little bit worried I've got to admit and I was really worried that our season was sort of peter out and There'd be nothing, nothing from it. But I, I needn't have been worried, Tom, because we, we looked like a very good Premier League side playing against a Championship side and doing everything that needed to be done and dispatching with them with multiple goals, which could have been quite easily have been more. All of which were good goals, yeah. As well, um, yeah. It was, it was almost like it was easy, wasn't it? I mean, you, can't, you don't often say that with Saints, but it was easy. In many ways, it was easier than the Shrewsbury game. Oh, yeah, I mean, definitely. It made it look easier than the Shrewsbury game. And I think, I mean, obviously, we've got a much stronger team out there now. But, um, yeah, you know, Saints had players there with a the point to prove. Um, pretty much, you know, the strongest team Ralph could have named. Mm. Fair play to him. And, I guess he, you know, he knows he's got the luxury of going into best part of the two-week international break. So why not play your strongest team? Um, and yeah, we just, you know, we may. It was one of those games where, even though the difference between the championship and the Premier League is narrower than it's ever been, um, it made you realise why some players are Premier League players and other players are no longer Premier League mm. players. Uh, exhibit A is Steve Cook, um, who. You know, like, he's obviously a great professional. And God knows, you know, if someone goes on Wikipedia, you can find out how many games he's played. I imagine it's north of 350, probably. But, you know, my God, he looked like he was wanted to die by the end of, like, the first 60 minutes and near against Shea Adams and against Nathan Redmond and against Gineppo. Nathan Redmond made Steve Cook look, look very, very silly. But, I mean... We're going to get on to this, and I think we should luxuriate in, <laughs> in this game, Tom. So let's let's start from the start. You weren't far off with 350, by the way. 345. There you go. Yeah. Mind you, that's actually just for Bournemouth. God, he's only 29. Yeah. He had a tough paper on, didn't he? <laughs> uh, 380 games in his career in total. No, 425 if you include all the... Uh... He's a former Spitfire, John. A former sp- what? Played at Eastleigh. Played ten games on loan at Eastleigh. Oh well, there we go. There you go. He's played for every every side on the south coast, but let's say apart from yeah, Southampton. Every, every generic south coast side, he's, he's he's had a stint. Yeah. Um. Let's talk about that Carl Walker Peters cross, which was turned in for an own goal. A because I've really enjoyed Carl Walker Peters' build up play, but B because Bednarek played a ball like he was. Yannick Vestergaard. Yeah, and I think that's quite exciting, isn't it? Um, if 
if we start to have two defenders who can do that, because um, I don't think that's been in Benderet's locker, is it, really? I mean, it, it helps that uh, Bournemouth gave um, Walker Peters the freedom of the South Coast to make that run. Um, Shame but, yeah. he didn't manage to time it so that he wasn't no. offside, but, you know. But it, it has been almost probably our most fruitful attacking ploy this season, maybe apart from direct free kicks, has been that pass. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the Vestigar to Carl Walker Peters has been great, and here it was Bednarek doing that that job. Really enjoyed that ball. Really enjoyed the build up play. Really enjoyed the own goal. Didn't enjoy the VAR check so much. No, and it, and it is another one, isn't it? Where um, it doesn't. It still looks like they're kind of making it up because mm. the angle's not right. The angles are, you know, it's not straight down the line is it it's the, well they, if they really want to persevere with this they just need to have a camera that follows yeah the ball up and down the side of the pitch well they should have it like um you know um for any older listeners out there who remember the matrix when it first came out oh, it was the most exciting thing that would ever come out and and you know the scenes where they film around people oh, yeah and that's done because they just simply have loads of cameras that go do, 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 around you. Right. So I don't know why they haven't got like thousands of cameras, you know, like to your point, John, almost like every centimetre have a tiny camera that literally as the ball moves past it, kicks into life. I, mean, I don't, there's probably a reason why they don't, but you know what? I mean, for me, what they're looking at is a weird, cause it's an angle, which is kind of, um, you're not side on, are you? You're like, and then you just draw an arbitrary line and you're like, well, yeah, that, there you go, that bit is, even though you can play the ball with that bit. But also, there's absolutely no way from a 2D photograph at that angle that you could actually genuinely tell <laughs> which part of the body is. But, uh, yeah, and also it goes against um, the spirit of football, doesn't it? Because players are coached to push your, push your body forward to gain the advantage because at the end of the day you can't touch the ball with your hands anyway. So you, mm. you, yeah, you probably won't touch it with your shoulders. So you should be pushing forward. The goal, the, the point of football is to score goals. And that's why, you know, things have generally been in favor of the attacker, but it's just so such a weird rule. I mean, ultimately in this one, it doesn't matter, but you can guarantee it will matter in the next one. Well, and it, it has done him. Past games as well, hasn't it? I mean, if it, let, let's continue on through the game. And Bertrand had a pretty dreadful miss from a, some really nice build-up play from Armstrong. More, I wanted to just like give Armstrong a bit of a mention because he was brilliant at, again today. And uh, Danjuma um, forced a save out of Fraser Forster. It was almost the. F- I don't know if this one was even on target, but he hasn't faced many shots on target, has he, in the FA Cup? Fraser Forster. Lucky this was at like head height as well, so you yeah. can do. Dan Juma looks like a good little player. Yeah, he looks all right, didn't he? Benrick uh, took him out quite nicely, didn't he, for his yellow card? Yeah, and that was an interesting thing, Ralph. Did that we'll come to the double snub. Mm. Um, and then we had one of those sort of like Saints d- doing dodgy defending from a, a a free kick cross from deep. But I mean, none, none of those really bothered us that much I don't I never really felt like we're massively under threat and then we get to the point where um was it Ward Prowse picks up the ball in midfield gets it onto Redmond Redmond goes on a really lovely run and uh threads a perfectly weighted through ball to Gineppe who times his run brilliantly coming from deep and uh and slots it away fantastic finish yeah, a great goal. And I, I, you wonder if this is Redmond's future. You want, you know, you wonder if like Redmond is not ever going to be a centre forward, is he? He's clearly like lacks the finishing guile to do that, and he lacks the kind of um, ability to not panic consistently. You know, like great strikers, don't they? Just mm. don't, like, like how good Michael Owen was. Went through one on one, never panicked. Just knew what he was going to do the minute he picked the ball up, and then that he did it. Um, you know, Danny Ings is a really good finisher. Nate Redmond is is not got that level of calmness about yeah. him. But where Nathan Redmond does seem to be effective for Saints is this thing here where he picks the ball, he drifts between midfield and attack, picks the ball up and finds a pass. And he, he did it against Chelsea with Minamino. And 
you know, maybe we just need to come to terms with the fact that Nathan is not going to be a slaloming winger being his man. And is, instead, it, is this all Claude Puel's fault for mentioning Thierry Henry? Yeah, but the, the, the mad thing is, and, and this was in the, um, I think the Times review of the match picked it up quite well, or the Guardian basically picked up that you know, he's had an interesting career. Nathan Rimm's career has not probably panned out the way they thought it was going to pan out. You know, like second youngest player to ever play for Birmingham after certain Trevor Francis, you know, moved to Norwich, does well in the Premier League, gets relegated, stays in the Premier League with Saints. And you think this is it. You know, the guy's going to kick on and then he's in fits and spurts. He's done it. And I think maybe, yeah, he's lost his confidence. I think it's two things. He's lost his confidence and Bertrand isn't the player he was. Mm. So Bertrand before, you know, did those brilliant, like, gut-busting runs behind him, and Bertrand's kind of stopped doing those most of the time. Um, but maybe this is the evolution of Nathan and He's still only 27. God, it's mad, old. isn't it? He just seems to have been around forever, and he looks a little bit older. But maybe the evolution of Nathan Redmond is this kind of, you know, player that kind of false, false 10 or whatever is that drops off the wing. And, and, you know, you can imagine with Saints how much the fullbacks attack. If Redmond drops off and the fullbacks push up and we've got two forwards and you, then you've got Stuart Armstrong running in from the other side, that's overloading the red zone. Fantastic. It's, I mean, it's interesting with Nathan Redmond because he's, he is fr- a frustrating player to watch. I think because you know he's got performances like this one in him, deep, buried deep within the bones of his body. And he also was player of the season for us not, not long hmm. ago. When Ralph turned up, he was... You know, Ralph, he was like the main man, wasn't he? Yeah. For that sort of run of like 12 games. Yeah, after Mark Hughes left and Ralph came in, yeah, he did really, really well. And he's obviously, you know, he's played for England, he's played consistently in the England under-21s. He's obviously got real talent. And, you know, we know that his praise is um, is sort of damning with faint praise. But, um, uh, you know, Guardiola has praised him. Mm-hmm. And we know... On his day, he can be unplayable, but that's the difference, isn't it? He doesn't have many of those days, but, you know, you bloody hell, give credit where it's due. He yeah, had one on Saturday. He doesn't, he doesn't have that many, but then, like, the, you, if we're sort of chasing a game, I'd almost rather have, you know, Redmond and Bertrand is sort of like a, it, it's a safe bet in terms of an outlet. Like, you know you're going to get an attack and a chance out of those two coming up the left wing. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, Teller is an interesting player. Mm. Against Brighton, Teller disappeared. Yeah. yeah. He's just there. And I, I think, you know, Redmond had that chance in the FA Cup and he stepped up and he took it. And I think now, you know, uh, Ralph has a problem against Burnley. Yeah. But I, don't know. I, I was surprised as well that you mentioned um, Michael Lowen already in this podcast, Tom, because I was going to mention Michael Owen for Redmond's second goal, yeah. the 2-0. And uh, this was something that Glenn Hoddle mentioned on the commentary, didn't he? He was obviously manager of England during France 98 World Cup when Michael Owen scored that wonderful goal against Argentina. Can you can you see it in your head? I can, but can you tell me who the defender was that he put on his ass? Was it Pochettino? It was Pochettino, yeah. yeah long-haired Pochettino. Yeah, um, so yeah, sort of like sprinting past Pochettino, sort of smashing it into the roof of the net. And this this was, a, you know, it was like the Vitality Stadium version. I mean, it wasn't... The the problem with the ground, the Vitality Stadium, is the, the TV gantry is too low. Okay. So if, if you think of the Michael Owen goal against Argentina, you've got, you know, from a very high view looking down, and it feels epic. The pitch looks enormous. yeah. And because the vitality is saying the, the camera is a lot lower, you feel a lot, you're a lot closer to the pitch. It doesn't look as epic when he does it, but as, essentially it's sort of going from a similar part of the pitch, ending up in a similar sort of place, running away from everybody, then smashing it into the, the top of the, the, the goal past the keeper. It was great, really great. And also um, we can add it to um, the second chest assist of the season. Yes. Just, what was so his much first one? The first one was the Shea Adams uh, volley against um, oh, Sheffield. Yes. You know, what's not to love about Stuart Armstrong? Even his chest. <laughs> Even is, his chest is wonderful. 
is just incredible, as I'm sure Mrs. Armstrong will 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 testify. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's but it, but all joking aside, yeah, Armstrong, Nathan Redmond gets to run on everyone, and one of the reasons he probably gets the run is because people are probably like you know in that micro millisecond, the Bournemouth players are probably thinking about what Stuart Armstrong is going to do. They're just dazzled by his chest, Tom. They're dazzled by his chest, but all things like they're probably thinking, right, he's going to, what can he do from here? He's going to probably have to, like, hook a long ball, you know, a slow arcing ball over the top, in which case it's a foot race. Steve Cook's bigger. He might be able to block it. But instead, because he, he does something completely unexpected, Redmond's gone. You know, by the time anyone realises what's happening... Um, he's off. And he's off, and Steve Cook, it's safe to say, struggled to keep up. It's probably the most polite way of putting it. I did like the photograph of Steve Cook sort of like on all fours, you know, sorrowfully looking up at Nathan Redmond as he was smashing the ball into the roof of the net. It was, it was very amusing. Yeah, it was. It had a kind of air of... Um, my Probably my favourite non... I have two non-favourite Southampton goals ever. One is the dance at volley against Bayer Leverkusen. Mm-hmm. Um and the other one is, do you remember Meza Ozil? Where Meza Ozil goes through and he's got two defenders and a goalkeeper to beat. And he he basically does what Minamino does. You know, where you put him on his on his backside, but, but like Ozil does it like three times. Yeah. Like it's you're up against someone and then just sort of scoops it into the net. And there's a brilliant like camera shot of like of like Ozil like scoring. And you can just see like players on the floor, like looking yeah. up at him how has he managed to do this? And it had a kind of air of like, Steve Cook was like, Steve Cook like he won like a competition, didn't need to play against the professional. <laughs> oh, Steve <laughs> Cook, are you listening? 380 odd appearances and you look like you won yeah. a competition to play against Nathan Redmond. But yeah, Redmond was, it was a great, but also, not only he put Steve Cook on his butt, it's a great finish. Oh, it really was. It's had everything, all- Tom. Yeah. And also, like I, th- you know, I thought, what's I thought, Begovic is a good keeper, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's not he's not some bang average Blake. He's a really good keeper. It's like, you know, he could have probably done a job at Saints. Yeah, um, scored against Saints, but um, yeah, it was a great goal. Yeah, re- really good. Back. And then great to be going in half time two 0 up. Almost feels like the job's already done. Apart from we know that Saints winning two 0 is almost our most dangerous. Scoreline that and eight, that and being eight nil down that's our most dangerous scoreline. Yeah, we don't come back from eight 0 No. Um, after half time, I mean, pff, Bournemouth weren't really up to much. Wilshire had a shot which went into the side netting, it's, wasn't it? Yeah. Wilshire's an interesting. I mean, I've been thinking about this: that players that were available that give you something slightly different, and Saints struggle to you know Wilshire is a classic example isn't he of a player that won't play many games but can unpick defences and do something slightly unusual I th- and I thought even actually I think the problem do- with someone like Wilshire though like let, let's say if you're Bournemouth or if you're Saints and he does well for a few games you then start relying on him and start building tactics and moves yeah. around him and then, and then he's out it. for a few months and then it's just like then you have to start again so, yes, but almost only as a luxury player that you bring on at half time to unlock a side. Because yeah. I, I think he's too flaky to be. Look good, though. Did yeah. you see the fact on Vestigal as well? Where he, he tries to two footed. Oh, he got away with that. Yeah. He got away with that. And I was. I thought he was going to get at least booked. Mm. It was a nasty one. And he's lucky it was Vestigal and not. Yeah, yeah Vestigar sort of like shrugged, didn't he? Yeah, Vestigar was a bit like, you know in Lord of the Rings where like uh, an orc attacks an Ent? <laughs> For non-Lord of the Rings fans, an Ent is a giant tree monster. <laughs> um, but it had an air of that, didn't it? Where like, you know, where they looks down and the Ent looks down and just throws or throws this orc. Um, hey, Tom, you kill. haven't even described what an orc is. An orc is an aggressive goblin. Um, think Jamie Vardy. <laughs> it is a bit like an orc, uh, but like, but yeah, it did have that. I, I thought it was a horrible challenge, to be honest. Yeah, it was. It was really nasty. Do you remember <laughs> what Jack Stevens did to Jack Wilshire? 
Oh, you picked him up, didn't he, and threw him back on the ground. Yeah, this was after he tore Jack Wilshire tore Jack Stevens' shirt off him as Saints were on a counter attack. And then Jack Wilshire was coming up the rest of the pitch a little bit later. I think basically Jack Stevens just ended him, didn't he? Did Jack Stevens get sent off for that? Yes, very much so. It was worth it, though. Yeah. Everyone was just like, yeah, I'd have done exactly the same thing. Yeah, Wilshire's, let's just say, divides opinion. Um, he has a nasty challenge, Jack Wilshire. He's a Come nasty on. guy, isn't he, though? Yeah. He is, he's a horrible little bit of work. Maybe. You quite like him, don't you? No, I think he's probably one of those blokes who's had a horrible time from the tabloids. Mm. Probably everything he does gets blown out of proportion. Also, he loves a fag, doesn't he? He likes a drink. He's English. Yeah. He's but, but nasty challenge. But there's another nasty challenge we can talk about as well towards the end of the game, John. Oh, yeah. Um, before we get to that, we've got Adam's disallowed goal from offside the VAR I mean this this was like one of those goals which pre-VAR Every no, time. No, yeah. that would count and nobody would even give it a second thought would they because it sort of bounces between Adams and the defender and then comes off Adams' shoulder and at the point where it leaves Adams' shoulder Stuart Armstrong's offside isn't he yeah I mean it was offside I mean te- just- technically it's the correct decision but yeah I, I don't mind this one so much because it was offside and I, and it was clearly offside. And also, like, Bournemouth appealed for it straight away. Mm. You know, the, the arms went up and it was, a, it was a really smart finish from Adams. Again, you know, it would have been his fourth and four. And who would have thought that this bloke that we thought was only, you know, good for three or four yards out is now swamping them from outside the box with regularity. Yeah. I mean, if he can score a goal every... I mean, he, he's had... He got a goal disallowed... Um, Against Man City as well, didn't he? Yes, he did. I mean, which was unfair. Yeah. And he had a goal for a slide against Man United, which was totally very unfair. unfair. I mean, Carl Anker said at the beginning of the season about Shadams, he think he said he would score eight goals this season. Did he say eight? I think he said eight. And um, I think he's on seven now, isn't he, in the Premier League? I think he said more than eight. I think he said double figures, didn't he? I say he's on, how many is on the, I mean, six is on League Seven. Yeah. Tom, you've got to set me up with these stats so I have a chance to Google I, them before I get there. It's bad co hosting. Yeah. Um, let's get on to the, uh, the third goal then, the actual real goal. Um, this one sort of you know, comes from some really good work from James Ward Prowse. This is pressing deep into Bournemouth's half, the, the high press. And it's a sort of like, you know, perfect form, I suppose. James Will Prowse wins the ball back, gets it to Redmond, who plays it along to Armstrong. Armstrong has a really good shot, comes off the post. One of the things which does frustrate me about Redmond is he never follows in when someone's taking a shot. Stands there totally still and the ball comes perfectly back to him and he can just position it straight back into the corner it was a great finish and uh, he was absolutely in the right position yeah and it was, it was reminiscent of the Stuart Armstrong goal you against know, Wolves Wolves goal against Wolves um, and too often um, we've spoken about Redmond and we've spoken about his tendency to just blaze it over haven't we and, and lash it as hard as he can but this was just nice to see you know just a bit more composure um it was a lovely goal. There's so much to like about this goal as well. There's, like you say, there's the high press, there's change of powers, there's the beautiful form of Stuart Armstrong running onto the ball and hitting it, pinging it back off the post. And yeah, it was a really good goal. Do you think Stuart Armstrong so special? He's actually always trying to assist Redmond there. He's like, by look, I know it back off the post. I know the confidence Redders have this one. But <laughs> Pass it to you because that's boring. I can do that, but I won't do that. I'll ping it off the post to widen to get you a better angle. That's what he did. And it's such a shame that uh, those two didn't combine again for the you know the Redmond hat trick, and it nearly happens, isn't it? I mean, Armstrong ran from deep, absolutely lung busting run. Sort of, I think, runs out of steam a little bit. Sort of loses control of the ball, but manages to get it across to Redmond. A, sort of does a two footed challenge as well, in the middle, well on the ball. <laughs> On the ball, which could have been nasty if we caught someone, but we'll let yeah. him go. Um, but Rowan just flashes it wide. I mean, that would have been the perfect 
waving to bounce back, wasn't it? A hat trick. But, you know, he, he was involved in all three goals. One assist, two goals. Man of the match by a mile. Perfect game. Brilliant, brilliant performance. I think he was better against Liverpool at St Mary's in that first leg yeah, of the semi final league cup. Back. Who got the assist for him in that game? Was that Sims or I can't remember? God, I can't remember that. I just remember being in the Northern and watching that goal that he scored against Liverpool. Just as you know, one of those you know, when you're behind it and it just all happens in front of you, it's just wonderful. It was a great finish. He look, he's got it in him and and there's still, what, six games to go in the season? Five games to go in the season for Saints? No, it's more than that, isn't it? I don't think it is, John. Or is it? Or is it? God, we're, we're terrible, aren't we? Like, we need to have our stats in front of us, Tom. Yeah, I bet on the Saints delivery podcast, I bet they have all these to their hands, whereas we're like, we're just trying. We're just doing our best. No, we, um, we, we've got nine games left in the league. Right. And two FA Cup games to go as well. God, you cheeky bugger with the end there. No, I, 11 games to go, Tom. Games. Nathan Redmond can get 33 goals in that time. Look, I, he, can, he can crack on now. And we know how talented he is. And, you know, after this international break, we suddenly have an abundance of riches again, as long as everyone comes back fit. And we might also be joined by a super confident Nathan Redmond, which is great. That, that'd be really good. Um... So, other teams that have gone through to the semi-finals because we now, I, th- I think now we've got to look at the whole competition down to the last four. We've got Man United. Uh, no, we haven't. We've got Leicester who knocked out Man United. They look really good. Leicester looked brilliant. Yeah, I thought they looked really good when they beat us at the King Power. Mm. That was two 0 wasn't it? But you, you know how this season we've had against Wolves, against Arsenal where we've had this like double header FA Cup and league match and we've prioritised the FA Cup and it's gone well interestingly the FA Cup semi-final is going to be the week before the league game oh. and who have we got um, who do we have before so well it depends doesn't it because we were supposed to be playing Crystal Palace that weekend so it depends hopefully yep. they won't put it in between but we've got two games for then, Burnley and West Brom. By God, Saints, you've got to take six points from those games, haven't we? You'd hope so. We'll probably lose at home to Burnley and beat West Brom away. Oh, man. And then so, then it's going to be Chelsea and Man City in the other semi-final. Who do you think is going to win that one, Tom? Who's going to go through to the final? It has to be Man City, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I would fancy Saints' chances against Chelsea. Yeah. In the final, so would no. I. I. I would fancy that. I wouldn't be. Dis- I wouldn't go into it like I imagine Watford fans went into the FA Cup final against Man City. You know, I would go into that thinking, you know what, with a fair win and a bit of luck, we, we can, can win this. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. Mean, I Leicester game is winnable. It's winnable, but they're good. They're really good. Um, but it's winnable and you know you've got to hope by that time you have Danny Ings back um, he's going to have a point to prove ahead of his big summer move to Man City um, you know why not we'd all be forgiven if, if Danny Ings leads us to an FA Cup famous FA Cup victory yeah and sails off into the distance sounds like he's off ski doesn't it um, you know but look, what matters is here and now Two two more Premier League games that we can win and then an FA Cup semi-final. I mean, this could be a great April for Saints. Tom, you're so optimistic every time we record. We've totally forgotten about that Brighton game. Yeah, but you have to be there because you, you have to, all you've got to hope is that they now have a lot, What the, the good thing is about the international break is they now have a lot of time to work, don't they? You know, like with the core of that team, they're going to get time to work with the players, hopefully. Um, so, yeah. You've you got to hope you can put it right. I mean, they can't play like they play. They can't play as badly again like they did play against Brighton. That's almost impossible, surely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you certainly hope so, anyway. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I, let's really focus international break, winning the FA, you know, winning the FA Cup semi final and getting through to the final would be absolutely brilliant. Anything can happen at a final. We've yeah. beaten both Man City and Chelsea within the last, what, 18 months? Yep. And, and like you say, anything can happen. And mm. by that stage, Man City, even, you know, this is a ridiculous thing to say. If we get through to the final and if we play Man City, Man City will be fighting on four fronts. Yeah, they've got an unprecedented quadruple. And one way you could look at that, if you're a pessimist, is to say, well, they can't lose because this is history. The other way of looking at it is going, they're going to be knackered. But then when you look at their bench and you see they could basically swap out their entire first choice 11 for another first choice 11, which is equally good, um, then yeah, it's a bit alarming. But they can lose. They've been beaten this season. Yeah. By Man United, who lost to Leicester. Yeah. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Um, so, oh, well, I think I think on that note, um, God, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling all excited, Tom. I mean, we, we, our next three games are Burnley at home, West Brom away, and Leicester City in the FA Cup semi-final. These are season-defining games, John. It'd be, be nice to go on a 11-match winning streak now, wouldn't it? I'd take that. I'd put us in Europe. But yeah, yeah. Hey, look, where were you? You know, this is this could be a great time. Could be terrible, but um, let's be optimistic. What they've got to do is go into that Leicester game having won the previous three games. Well, uh, no, yes, that's yes. what they have. To do. You're right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, are we going to see Saints going through to the FA Cup final? Are we going to get six points from Burnley and West Brom away? Can we forget about relegation and just focus on a glorious march um, to FA Cup glory? And also... I think people need to start coming up with ideas for what we do if we get to the final and we can't actually go and watch them in the stadium. We need to, we need to, we need to secretly hatch some ideas out here, Saints fans. We need to go on a protest, but have a big screen there. Yeah. Well, protests will be illegal by then, Tom. No. Oh, with, with this new bill. As oh. long as we don't conv- cause any nuisance. Yeah. Well, I can't promise anything. But yeah, look, we're... Imagine that we go on a European tour next summer, John. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a, a pleasure um, working through this. I mean, working through two dreadful results and uh, one result which should really have been as expected. But we're in the FA Cup semi-final and I'm excited about that. So there we go. Very much so. Right. Cheerio, everyone. Good night. <laughs>